so many people get so much benefit from self-organizing groups like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. I wonder if these kind of things could be expanded across lots of other mental health diagnoses. Because if you have an alcohol problem, you can get group therapy free of charge anywhere in the world, pretty much in an urban setting, for life. And, and that, when you think about it, that is a really incredible provision. And it, I think it would be great if that could be extended to other disorders. And maybe they just need a push to achieve that. But I think that something like that, there's no technology in it, could also be really transformative for mental health care. Welcome to the Mind Tech Podcast, where we dive deep into the unsolved problems in mental health with the founders, investors, and experts building technology to solve them. Dr. Rick Adams is a consultant psychiatrist, widely published researcher, and a future leaders fellow in the UCL Department of Computer Science and Division of Psychiatry. Most interestingly to the Mind Tech community, Rick is a leader in the field of computational psychiatry a discipline applying computational methods to understanding psychiatric problems. Rick completed a PhD in this niche and now runs a computational psychiatry lab at UCL. So there really aren't many people in the world more qualified to discuss the potential for computer science to transform mental health. In this episode, we will cover how we can model the brain as a biological computer, the barriers to overcome in translating computational theory into clinical practice, and the technology that could be adopted immediately in his psychiatry clinic. Let's dive in. Welcome, Rick. It's awesome to have you on the Mind Tech podcast. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. So to dive straight in, computational psychiatry is a field that you have made a life's work out of, really. And to give a vague definition for the audience, it's a discipline applying computational methods to understanding psychiatric problems. And it's one of the best examples of a field that leverages the power of technology to improve mental health, aligning perfectly with the Mind Tech podcast, of course. So that's why it's an honor to welcome you on, Rick, a true leader in computational psychiatry, having given countless talks on computational psychiatry at conferences around the world, including the World Economic Forum, and having started the world's first computational psychiatry course at UCL, which has recently given birth to an annual conference. Congratulations, by the way. Thanks. So to bring the listeners up to speed on this field, could you give a slightly less vague definition than the one I gave and give some clarity on what exactly computational psychiatry is? Sure. So it's, a, it's a, actually a bundle of a few different things which are just connected really by what they're studying, psychiatric disorders. So one strand is, is using computational models of the mind to try and figure out how things like hallucinations or delusions or loss of motivation might come about. Uh, which is quite connected to the AI type field. Then there's um, using computational modeling to understand physiological processes going on behind neuroimaging data. So this is a completely different field trying to figure out if there are differences in the brain um, with people with or without a disorder. And these are kind of biophysical models. And then there's a third strand, which is essentially using big data sets to try to predict things. And that could be, you know, predict relapse or predict optimal treatment. And that could be using biological data or psychological data or anything. And so, yeah, they're, they're all computational approaches, but quite, quite different from each other. So how exactly does understanding the brain as a biological computer help model things like disease and areas for potential treatment so in so my if i give some examples from my area mm -hmm. um which is studying psychosis and uh, schizophrenia and uh, related disorders um so we've begun to learn quite a lot about how perception might work and how um the brain is is kind of organized in this hierarchical way where sensory input comes at in the bottom and it gets processed and sent to the next area and then to the next area and to the next area up. And um, over the last few years, you know, Google image recognition and uh, all sorts of image recognition software has been developed that is, has this similar kind of hierarchical structure. 
And so you can then ask, well, actually, maybe our, things like hallucinations may come about because of some perturbation in this um, in, in these algorithms. And if if you can actually build algorithms that can do perception in an artificial way, um, this can give you a lot of insight into how they might malfunction in some way and hallucinate. Uh, and and that may or may not translate uh, into the human case too. Um, obviously, there's no guarantee that the same cause will uh, obtain in both cases. But um, building something and seeing how it works is a great way to figure out how it might go wrong. And, and, and you get lots of counterintuitive insights from doing it that way. So I guess it's kind of like if you were to build a model of a home or like a tower and in a way test how it would endure things like fast wind speeds or a flood and trying to figure out oh, okay the weakness might be there maybe that's going to reveal a potential weakness in the real thing then just by modeling we can gain an understanding of where we might be able to have an impact is that right exactly exactly because the thing is when the model becomes quite complicated um, it becomes very hard to predict how it will work, especially over sustained periods of time. And so it can produce effects that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, you know, it has what we call kind of non-linearities to it that you get, you get, if you increase the input slightly, you might get a drastically different output. And I think that these kinds of effects are probably very important in mental health, um, so that's why it becomes useful. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of engineering approach, if you like. Yeah, so it can, when unintended consequences happen to the model, it then makes you think, oh, actually, that might be an unintended consequence of giving this drug to this person in real life as well. So it's almost like a simulation in a way, which yeah. uh, better prepares you for dealing with things in the real world. Interesting. So... Mm -hmm. One of the most difficult aspects of treating mental health disorders is, as you know very well, they are incredibly complex, involving a blend of genetic, biological, environmental, and psychological factors, which not only have their own effect, but they all interact with each other. And then there's the whole host of unpredictable consequences as well, which makes things very difficult for professionals to understand, diagnose, and treat. But I guess with computational models, we can then begin to really input all of this data into a system that is able to make sense of it. So how can computational psychiatry better make sense of all the complexity? Um, so good question. I mean, I think so when you're trying to deal with all kinds of different d data, so not just behavioral responses in a task or something like that, but all kinds of different data, biological data, sociological data, psychological data, then you're really dealing with, a, with these kinds of um, uh, neural network type models that just try to predict an outcome, for example, based on lots and lots of different data types. And to do that, to do that well, it's becoming increasingly obvious that we probably need um, lots and lots of data from the same person over some sustained period of time. Um, this, so lots of kind of within subject data modeled longitudinally. Uh, the reason I say that is because it is extremely difficult to predict things accurately about people um, from even very large data sets. There's, there's still a huge amount of a variance there that is you know just very very difficult to predict and the, the very and the best way to predict if someone is becoming unwell for example is just to is just to have the model know exactly what they're like when they're well and the way to do that is to have a lot of longitudinal data stored from that particular subject so up until now models based on enormous numbers of samples have not done a great job of telling us which antidepressants someone picked at random would take or you know whether someone will relapse um, and I think to do that we're going to need models that have a lot of your individual data stored over some long period of time then obviously that carries implications for privacy etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, does that yeah answer your question yeah so 
from what you've just told me, um, correct me if I'm wrong, we need high quality data, which would come from detailed measurements of the same person over a long mm -hmm. period of time. And we need that. We need ideally many, many subjects to be involved to get enough data that we can have reliability in how we analyze that data. Yeah. Um, now, for me, that actually makes me think that something like consumer apps on our smartphones might be able to play a really pivotal role in that. Is that something you envision as well? Yeah, I mean, it's become a huge area of development in the last few years. There's now loads of mental health um, orientated apps out there. Um, I haven't, I have to say, I haven't seen any that really convincingly um, make a big difference to outcomes. And, and there've been quite a few quite prominent failures in this area. So, so there was one called MindStrong that raised a huge amount of VC funding. Um, it was employing Tom Insel, the ex head of the National Institute of Mental Health in the US for a time. And um, they, but they, yeah, they really struggled to, to have an impact. And in the end, I think that, that their funders just pulled out. Um, and so it is, it is an area of enormous interest. And apps do seem like a very intuitive way to get a handle on, you know, behavior and detailed within subject sampling because people use their phones every day um but for yeah for for not obvious reasons they just haven't been able to make a substantial impact yet and so uh, i think we need probably a bit another step of innovation in order to do so hmm. what do you think they're missing because yeah, you're, tracking... I set myself up there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so they, they give insight, right, into the nature of one's mental state with a variety of data inputs. And it does all of this sophisticated stuff with the data. But mm. clearly, those insights aren't being transformed into real behavior change. And mm. do, do you think it's it takes them being integrated into real healthcare systems to work or what do you think would close that gap essentially from insight to real lasting behavior change? So I don't think it's the only thing, but integrating into healthcare systems would be really useful just from the doctor's point of view, because, um, you know, going to see people in clinic and asking them how they're sleeping and they say badly, um, it's, and that the alternative is that you can see a sleep record of theirs from the last three months that would be an, so much more informative and useful. And so, um, yeah, in, integrating these these things as kind of just data collecting devices into normal clinical care would be extremely would be extremely useful. Um, but how to make them kind of autonomously useful is is really quite is more tricky. So, for one thing, maybe we need better models of how all of these different factors interact instead of just taking a kind of black box approach and trying to predict things using loads and loads of data points maybe maybe we need to be more selective and have and understand uh individuals a bit a bit better and how the what the key factors are in in particular individuals and how they interact and use that and, and that may enable prediction at an individual level um you know there's, there's there is a company a, a company at the moment that after lots of trying all over the world has actually shown that they can use eeg to predict um antidepressant response um not perfectly but with a correlation of about 0.7 which is pretty good uh in the, it was very good in this area obviously that's eeg that's not information collected from an app but maybe we need to integrate, you know, the easy behavioral measures that we get from apps with more kind of neurobiological measures um, like, the, you, like the ones that you get from EEG. But obviously, that starts to make things more complicated. But uh, yeah, that may also be the way to go. Mm -hmm. One of the companies that I work closely with, Mind Science Health, based in Singapore, they actually have a EEG hardware and 
associated AI software to analyze data from that EEG, as well as an app for patients and, and their clinicians, which tracks uh, elements related to mood. So perhaps they are well positioned to make use of that combination of EEG and smartphone data. And perhaps we need to look at combining those forms of data before we can start relying on smartphone data alone. Definitely something to, to look into. Also, one aspect that you just mentioned there, the uh, heterogeneity, which uh, for those who may be unfamiliar with the term heterogeneity means there's a lot of variation in how um, each disorder appears in different people. And it relates to one of the most disputed assumptions in psychiatry, which is the way it classifies each uh, psychiatric disorder because there's so much heterogeneity in disease presentation. And this makes it very tricky to accurately diagnose people, which is essentially a way of grouping people so we know how to treat them best. For example, people who have different mental health problems could all on the surface present with depression. And so all of them may be treated according to the same protocol for depression, which will sadly mean that many of them who don't exactly have depression as defined by the classification system won't improve with the treatment. So Rick, how can computational methods get beyond surface symptoms to find underlying causes and develop approaches that are specific to each patient rather than being so generalizable that they don't end up being very effective for individual patients? Yeah, so I mean, this is a really question of a great interest uh, in the field at the moment. It's something that um, we're doing a project on as well. Um, so one way the, the idea, as you say, is that maybe you can get the same symptoms in different ways. Um, or, in fact, you maybe have a disorder in which people have totally different symptoms and those different constellations of symptoms within that umbrella of the disorder actually are kind of different mini sub disorders and you should treat them differently. So one way to try to separate these groups out is to just stop using only symptom data to define disorders and try and integrate other forms of data usually neurobiological data but you could use other you know there's no reason you could use other kinds and so just to give you an example of what we've been working on um there's some there's some evidence that um patients uh with uh suffering from schizophrenia or, or other psychotic disorders like bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder. Within that kind of group, there may be people with different underlying uh, changes in their cortex, the bit of the, the, the big bit of the brain around the outside. And, and putting it very simply, some people may have cortex which is kind of disinhibited uh, firing too much and some people may have cortex which is hypoactive so firing too little um, if you put that in kind of signal to noise terms some people have may maybe not enough signal some people maybe have too much noise so there is the same ratio but but for different reasons and you could only and, and that means that it could look they could look the same on the level of symptoms, but then you could might be able to distinguish them using, for example, EEG or um, MEG. And so, yeah, that's the hope of the project that we're get engaged in at the moment, try, trying to uh, look at the EEGs of people with these uh, symptoms and then try and use modeling to figure out whether they go into the hypoactive camp or the disinhibited camp. Uh, but you could do similar with fMRI, like people in the depressions uh, and anxiety research field have been trying to look at um, people just resting in an fMRI scanner and using the the data that they get from that to try to group uh, people differently. Um, but it's quite hard to find new groupings. You need a lot of subjects to do it um, because the whole thing is the whole process is very noisy. Um, so there have been multiple attempts and um, it, 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 in various different disorders, but it's quite rare to see two groups converge on the same groupings um, using different methods. Yeah, the, the amount of data that could be processed for each individual with computational psychiatry 
Do you think that could evolve our understanding of mental disorders to a point where the lines between disorders are blurred so, so much so that instead of labeling people with moderate depression or generalized anxiety, we can give a much more detailed and personalized explanation of disorders that each person experiences, not grouping them with others, but putting them in a group of their own, so to speak, or perhaps just creating many, many more groups that, you know, could be 10x what currently exists today. I mean, so I, th I think you, you might read that in lots of people's grant applications, <laughs> whether the reality is, I think that, so the problem is, is that um, the smaller the group, um, the harder it is to estimate accurately whether someone belongs to it. So you get down to this kind of pre pre precision pers or personalized medicine approach, right? Um, and I once saw a, st a statistician uh, tweeting about this. He put it, I can't remember his exact quote, but w his point was that um, what pe nobody mentions when they talk about precision medicine or personalized medicine is that um, it's essentially just the same as estimating the parameters of a group. But uh when you reduce the size of that group down to one your accuracy of estimation goes down and down and down and down and down and down and so um there's just more more and more and more noise uh involved and so i have to say it's it's i haven't seen any indication that we're going to get to this level of being able to make super individualized predictions and completely junk uh, um, the notion of, of kind of disorder groupings yet. I mean, it, it's a theoretical idea, maybe. Um, and there's some examples where definitely you can get useful individual information. Like, for example, you can find out what kind of metabolic enzymes people have and whether they will result in them having high blood levels of a particular medication or not. Like that is very useful within subject information. But in this more complex kind of mental health um, space, um, I think the very a super individual diagnosis is, is very far away. Hmm. Interesting how computational psychiatry opens the conversation though to moving the needle towards something like this it just really speaks to the potential for personalization and granularity that it offers which is really cool really i mean it does um, it does it does uh, clearly break down barriers between disorders and non-disorders because mm -hmm. you know you 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 have to build a functioning model of the process that you're interested in, like, for example, learning from rewards or, 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 or whatever. And then small tweaks to that can then push the system into not learning very well from rewards or, or, or beginning to value everything less, i.e. it may be becoming depressed. Um, but it's clear from the, the model that there's only a small difference in the initial conditions in the in the model that ends up depressed and the model that doesn't so it's obvious that there's you know there's, there's no clear dividing line between these groups and so the notion that the very categorical notion of disorders starts to evaporate when you when you're when you're using these um models interesting another focus of your work has been related to the second point that i think you mentioned earlier about one of the types of ways computational models can be applied in psychiatry, which is modeling based on brain imaging and specifically linking subtle patterns of activity in brain imaging data to receptors or neurons that drugs can target, improving decisions about which treatments to recommend to individual subjects. Can you give an example of a successful case of this from your research? Um, sadly, not from my research. <laughs> Although <laughs> we're trying, I mean, we are, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to do something similar um, mm -hmm. in allocating what are known as glutamatergic drugs 
in psychosis. So glutamate um, is the commonest neurotransmitter used in the brain. It's used everywhere. And there's various different receptors that use it. And there's masses and masses and masses of evidence that it's involved or it, the receptors uh, for it are involved in psychosis and related disorders. Um, but all attempts to create drugs that manipulate these receptors and treat psychosis have, have failed so far. Um, and one reason might be that uh, this explanation that I was alluding to before, that maybe if you have some people with a hypoactive cortex and some people with a disinhibited cortex, you might need to give the opposite treatment to these different groups, one to kind of increase activity, one to reduce activity. Uh, and that's the, the point of our current project, to see if we can allocate treatments or, or predict the outcome of a treatment based on this EEG measure. And if that works then potentially all of this investment into glutamatergic drugs could be unlocked and applied to patients. Um, in the wider field, there is, there's really only this one company, um, I think called Alto Neuroscience, led by Amit Etkin in California, who um, have been using machine learning applied to EG data to predict um, SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitor function in depression. Um, and actually, the, the, they're just using a kind of black box machine learning approach. And it's not completely clear what the neurobiological difference is that is indicating that someone will respond to a serotonergic boost. Obviously, the, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter for the patient if the patient is getting better, but it, it is it, from a mechanistic point of view for, for scientists, we're fascinated to know what this model is picking up on. But yes, the jury's out on that at the moment. We'll, we just have to follow that field. I think it's fascinating what you said there about how before computational models can be applied to, um, I, you know, identify potential receptors and neurons for drugs. We first need to use computational models to actually figure out how the brain changes in these diseases. So once we know how someone's brain has changed, but say for example, it, it's in schizophrenia and whether the activity is increased or decreased, like you mentioned, only then can we know what drug to give them, to give them the drug that produces that activity or increases it. So yeah, it's, uh, it's cool how this field has already identified that there's a whole step before creating the drug that needs to be done, which is really identifying what change do we need to actually make? Because there's so many different ways people's minds and brains change when a disease process occurs in mental health. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy not to integrate what we already know into applying these models. I mean, just taking a completely, completely hypothesis-free approach and just chucking as much data as you possibly can into some algorithm and, and hoping that it will find the right elements to predict outcomes, I think is, uh, you know, it's a Hail Mary. It's, it's not, mm. it's not a very, uh, um, it's not a, an approach that's very likely to succeed. Whereas if you, if, if you're much more hypothesis driven and you know where, which kinds of data points to focus your modeling, yeah, I, 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 think you stand a better chance of, um, you know, being able to discriminate between people on the grounds of what treatment they should get or that kind of thing. I, I, it, it, we've got so much research existing in this area, it's crazy not to integrate that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so just moving on to your clinical perspective from your clinical work, as a consultant psychiatrist, who is actively involved in improving approaches to care through means such as computational psychiatry and others. How do you think the current system of psychiatry can be better? Um, well, I mean, in the UK specifically, uh, the funding situation is terrible. And so lots of mental health teams are really on their knees and unable to innovate because uh, they can barely just cling on to what they're currently doing. In, a, in, a, in an ideal world, it would be great to have as many of these potentially useful predictors assessed when people first enter mental health services 
um, so that we can just gradually amass naturally as part of clinical care information that could then potentially be used to help predict outcomes. Obviously, that will not help the first generation of people in the system, um, but it might be really helpful for future generations of people in the system. And I think it would be great if funders could push for this kind of data set creation, like they funded these huge big data sets like UK Biobank. Um, it would be great if people could push for a kind of clinically integrated data set collection in younger people uh, when, they, when these illnesses usually present. Um, completely separate to that, I kind of, well, one thing I, I kind of think, which is nothing to do with the technology approach really, um, which would be kind of transformative for mental health is so many people get so much benefit from self-organizing groups like Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. I wonder if these kind of things could be expanded across lots of other mental health diagnoses, because if you have an alcohol problem, you can get group therapy free of charge anywhere in the world, pretty much in an urban setting for life. And, and that, when you think about it, that is a really incredible provision. And it, I think it would be great if that could be extended to other disorders. And maybe they just need a push to achieve that. But I think that something like that, there's no technology in it, could also be really transformative for mental health care. So, you know, all kinds of approaches, I think, could make a difference. Absolutely. That's a great point about how AA groups are free therapy and are so accessible. I guess the technology um, enabled aspect that could facilitate this is if these communities were to be set up online and connect people over virtual remote settings. Perhaps it's more effective in person, but compared to nothing, I'm sure it would be infinitely better. So there's potential for technology to improve there. It's also really mm -hmm. interesting that you say how immediately just tracking or just getting information about people on arrival could later improve resource allocation decisions because then that could be matched to their outcomes, which is, which is very um, practical and immediate. In your clinic, at the Camden Early Intervention in Psychosis NHS service, what other ways can you envision technology being adopted immediately? So these these kinds of services are so much more flexible than they used to be. So you, they used to be that you had to make an appointment and somebody had to come to the clinic at that appointment time. Whereas now everyone has mobiles, you can phone people up wherever they are, you can go and meet them for coffee, you can ping them text message reminders, uh, or message them ask, asking for an update how they are feeling. You can review people online over Zoom and other platforms. So this 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 kind of connectivity uh, with patients is much more fluid and adaptable, and potentially at you know more convenient for patients. It's less centered around clinicians wanting people to come to them. Um, we still don't have any useful you know b b kind of b basic um sleep appetite type information and in integrated as, as i was saying before it would be so useful if you could actually have a a measure of uh, how people are sleeping and tracking their mood um over the last two months to look at and, like, some people do use these mood trackers that you can get on uh, on apps, um, but then it's not fully integrated into care. It's a very Id idiosyncratic approach at the moment. Um, and then going forward in future, um, I don't know. I mean, it depends if we manage if we manage to kind of find, uh, you know, pr th th there's some there's some research groups, for example, in Germany, uh, led by Nikos. Uh, Kutsulurus, who has used machine learning approaches applied to brain imaging data to try to predict outcomes in, in people presenting with psychosis very early on. And there's millions of papers on this subject published, but 
he is the only person who's actually in, trying to integrate one of these algorithms into clinical care. He's doing, they're doing that right now. And so if that is a success, then maybe that is one thing that might start to change, that pe pe people will have a, uh, some brain imaging that will group them into uh, groups that you maybe need to allocate more resources to and groups that you don't need to allocate so many resources to in order to, you know, produce a certain level of functional outcome. But the yeah, the incredible amount of resources and effort that it's taken him to get this into a clinical setting is 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 awe inspiring and slightly <laughs> concerning for other researchers. Hmm. Yeah, hopefully he's broken his seal there, which um, can I open so, the floodgates. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Rick, it's been a real pleasure learning about all of these different elements of computational psychiatry really at the forefront of leveraging technology to improve mental health just to finish what are you working on right now that excites you the most so one thing is this project uh that i was i was discussing before if that really managed to work then you know potentially we could start to allocate these these drugs that have that target glutamate the receptors that have been lying on pharma company shelves for 10 to 20 years after Two, to something like two and a half billion dollars of investment that essentially has gone down the tubes so far. So if 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 we found out a way to allocate those in a in a in a rational uh, way using an inexpensive technology like EEG, I would be absolutely over the moon. In terms of other kind of interesting stuff, I think there's there's really interesting work going on in understanding some key brain areas that are also quite heavily implicated in, in schizophrenia psychosis. So there's amazing neuroscience work, computational neuroscience work going on at the moment. Um, lots of it at UCL with uh, Tim Behrens and Neil Burgess and Ray Dolan and others. Um, looking at um, this, this brain area called hippocampus, which, which is thought to kind of structure your knowledge um, at a very kind of high level. And um, generate hypotheses about how to interpret uh, unexpected um, uh, things that you see and um, how it links with other kind of executive areas. And these processes are kind of awry in, in psychotic disorders. And so this, this kind of computational understanding of how these areas work is is extremely interesting because now we have this understanding we might be able to see how how you it might be perturbed in psychosis and how you might draw the wrong conclusions when you're exposed to some new information um so that is much further from a functional treatment but it is equally fascinating from a kind of mechanistic point of view that we can really like understand these processes at the at the deepest level Mm -hmm. Yeah, drawing insights from computational neuroscience to develop our understanding in computational psychiatry would be awesome, which really does speak to the value of multidisciplinary collaboration here. So, yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful note to close on. Rick, it's been a real joy to learn about all the incredible work that you continue to do in leading the field of computational psychiatry. Thank you very much for, for coming on today. For everyone listening, um, how can people support and follow your work? So I have a UCL website. If you could just Google Rick Adams UCL, you'll find me. And there's some summaries of what we do. I'm desperately trying to code up our group <laughs> website, <laughs> but I've not had the hours in the day to finish it yet. So you can't see it yet. But maybe in if you're listening to this podcast in six months, um, try Googling me and hopefully you'll see a lab website too with all my talented lab members. <laughs> Wonderful. Great. I, I look forward to uh, checking that out whenever it comes up as well. But um, yeah, Rick, it's been a, been a real honor having you on. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for the invite. Every startup that has featured on MindTech is solving a mental health problem with a technology-enabled solution. To get a full picture of all the problems these startups are working on and all the solutions they're offering, sign up to the email list in the description to access the MindTech Matrix.
This is the first visual representation of how mental health problems are being matched by innovative solutions. You'll also be updated whenever there's a new episode and get early access to test some of the products that are discussed in the podcast. Everything you need is in the description.